if you're there in First Thessalonians chapter 4, and I want to preach a sermon that's, that's tailored more so because we're coming into a new year, and the title of the sermon is Increase More and More, Increase More and More. And so in this chapter, actually, there's a couple places where it's talking about increasing or abounding more and more. And the thing is, every year, this is what I'm thinking about as far as the fact that uh, I, wanted, I want at the end of the year to say, hey, I know more now than I did back when I started this year. I did more this year than I did the year before. And, you know, different things like that as far as the fact that do you know more doctrine now? Do you know more verses? Do you have more memorized? You know, have you seen more people saved? And, and I'm not necessarily saying, like, if you, got 60, or if you got 30 people saved a year and, like, just stayed at 30, I'm not saying, like, that has to increase every year. What I'm saying is that you had 30 saved last year. This year, did you have more? Did you get anybody else saved? You know, and stuff like that. But you can always be saying, hey, I want to do more. I want to increase it. I want to, you know, increase it steadily up and try to get more and more. Um, same thing with memorization, right? Because you memorize, let's say you memorize a book last year. You don't have to memorize two books this year and then three books next year and five books next year. You know, it's the fact that each year are you getting like a book memorized, for example, or a chapter, you know, and you don't have to have the same goals as everybody else. But notice in verse one there, this is our memory verse for the week. And I know it's a long one, but I think it really sums up what I'm trying to preach this morning, which it says in verse one, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. And it says, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. So he's basically saying, you know what what we commanded. You know how to walk, like we told, you know, like you ought to walk in the Lord. And, but we're saying, you know, you need to abound more and more in that. You need to keep going. You need to keep trying to increase that. Going down to verse 9 there, it says, it says, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in Mas- all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. So, you know, what, what it's talking about here is the fact that, hey, you already know that you love one another, and it's already manifest in all these places that that you are loving the brethren. So he's, he's, not, he's not coming here, coming down on them. He's saying, you're doing good. Keep doing it. And keep increasing. Keep abounding. More and more. And that's the thing that we should be thinking about is the fact that we're not content, right? We're not saying, well, this is enough. We're doing enough. No, we should always be saying, hey, there's more that we can learn. There's more that we can do. You know, we can still try to increase. Is there, any, is there anything in my life that I need to get cleaned up? Is there anything that I can do more efficient? Is there anything else that I can do to tighten things up? And there, there's always going to be that. I don't care who you are, but there's going to be things that you can do better, things that you can increase, things that you can uh, let off of the world a little bit more and all that. And so this isn't something where I'm saying like drastic changes have to happen, but what you're trying to do is say, okay, this year... I have a plan, I'm going to try to do this more, I'm going to try to do that more, and I'm going to try to go ahead in this new year trying to increase what I already have, okay? And go to Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1. So this abounding more and more, this increasing more and more, it's just a phrase that I've seen in the, you know, I see in the Bible and it just sticks out to me, you know, as a fact of like doing this more and more and uh, increasing and, you know, all that, that that deals with that. So in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more <coughs> in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So again, he's saying, you know, that your love may yet abound more and more. That, and it talks about that your love would increase more and more and that you would walk in the Lord and please God and abound yet more and more in that. And that's the thing that I see over and over again in the Bible. And I'm not going to show you at nauseum all the places where it says to increase or to abound and all this. But I do want to give you some basically just points on this as far as this isn't all inclusive. OK, as far as things to try to increase or things to try to abound in. But I'm just going to give you some of the big ones that I think are important 
especially at the beginning of the year where uh, you're going to start off your reading schedule, you know, you're going to try to, you know, read through the Bible at least once a year, you're trying to memorize more, you're trying to do this or that, you know, these are just certain (coughs) things that I think about anyway when it comes to things that I want to increase at the beginning of the year. And go to Revelation chapter 1, and the first thing that I get, when I think of the new year, I think of Bible reading. That's the first thing I think of is, can I increase my Bible reading? Is my Bible reading at you know, par where it needs to be? You know, uh, maybe you had a really good year, you know, and, and like as far as you're just really reading a lot, you know, you, you're kind of coming into the new year on a really good schedule, then just keep doing it. But let's say you're at the end of the year and you're like, man, I really was slacking, especially through the holiday season. You know, I didn't have a lot of time to read or this, this that, and the other. You know, it's a good time to say, okay, it's time to reset this thing and try to get on track and really hit this hard. I know Brother Stuckey, you know, sent out, uh, he, him and his church that's out in the, the Philippines, they're doing, uh, uh, going through the New Testament one month. And so this, this month of January, he's got a schedule and it was like, You'd read like Matthew 1 to 9 one day, and then you'd read like from 10 to 18 or 20 or something like that. And basically, it's a schedule within 31 days that you'd get through the whole New Testament. <clears throat> and I think you had a couple days. Honestly, I think it was like 29 days because I think there was two days where you had a grace period if like you missed a day or something like that. And so that's something that you could do. Um, but first, I want to show you some verses on this. So verse, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Notice what it says. It says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And so we see that, actually, there's, there's a blessing on reading. And you say, well, this is just this prophecy. No, this is going to apply to all the Bible. I'm going to show you other verses on it. But, you know, notice that reading and hearing. So you say, well, you know, I'm a bad reader. Well, join the club. Okay. I didn't grow up reading a lot. You know, I, that's why I went into engineering. It was more numbers, you know. <laughs> and then I figured out engineering was word problems, and then I'm like, what am I doing? But <laughs> obviously, as you're reading the Bible and you want to be a, Christ- you know, a good Christian, <coughs> you're trying, you need to really get into grammar. You need to get into reading, and you know, it's just, that's just the way it is. But there's something to be said about hearing as well, okay? And some people knock this, you know, um, as far as saying, well, hearing doesn't count. Like, listening to audio Bible doesn't count. I think that's hogwash. I mean, that, that right here, and that would take away from someone, let's say someone can't see, you know, and, and they, you know, I mean, you say, well, they could read Braille or whatever. Okay, but you're, are you saying, you, the whole reason that Alexander Scorby, you know, did the audio Bible, do you know the reason why he did it? It's for people that couldn't see. That's the reason he did it to begin with. Okay, it was for the purpose of, like, they couldn't see to read, therefore they could hear it. Okay, and I'm glad he did it, and I'm glad there's other, you know, if you don't like Alexander Scorby, listen to someone else. I don't care. You can listen to Samuel L. Jackson for all I care on reading the King James Bible if there's a version of him doing that. But all that to say is that, you know, when it comes down to hearing it, I think that there's a blessing in that, too. I think you should do both. Okay, but I'm just going to be honest, you know, when when it comes to a hectic life, I end up listening to the Bible more than I read it. Now, am I reading it? Of course I am. And my schedule with reading, go to Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 17. My schedule with reading, as far as what my goal is at the end of the year, is to read through the Bible and listen to the Bible four times. Okay? That's, you know, all together. Okay? I'm not saying I'm reading it four times and listening to it four times. But <clears throat> all that to say is that congruently, I'm getting through the Bible four times in a year. That's me as a pastor. Okay? That's my goal. Now, when I'm saying increase more and more, that doesn't mean that, okay, this year I'm doing five, next year I'm doing six, next year I'm doing seven, because that would re- be just kind of getting ridiculous, okay? And you can set different goals. Like, uh, I think that the, the schedule that Brother Stuckey had or has for the church out in Manila, I think that's a, that's a cool thing to do, uh, to get through the New Testament one month. I don't think that's sustainable, right, to do, like, read through the New Testament 12 times a year like that. I think that you're going to not end up reading the Old Testament like you should, and you're going to kind of lack on that. I read through the Bible in one month, one time. You know, I was single, didn't have kids, and, you know, I didn't have anything else to do, right? But I pretty much went to work, went to the gym, and just read. Just came home and read. And, you know, I was, and you say, well, I just can't read that fast. Listen, I'm a slow reader. 
you know, by the mark of like, if you're listening to Alexander Scorby, you should be able to get through the Bible once a year, 15 minutes a day. Okay. So if you want to get through it four times a year, what do you have to do? An hour, right? Simple math here, but an hour. Okay. So if you want to do it in a month, it comes out to about three hours a day of reading. Okay. It took me four. If you want to know my reading, like back then at least, it might be a little better now, but you want to know my reading speed, it took me four hours in, in general to do it, okay? And you say, well, that's crazy, you know? Yeah, it's a little crazy, but you know what? You have to be a little crazy to be a Christian sometimes if you want to really uh, get it. But here's the thing, I don't recommend doing that every month, and I don't think it's feasible for most people to do it every month, and I don't think it's actually that good to do it every month anyway because you want to be able to actually study the Bible and think about what you're reading. Because I would read through Genesis in two days, and I'd be in Exodus after two days, and just so much information. I mean, you're like, you know, I've read, I've read all the stories about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, you know, and then you're already into Moses. You're already past the Red Sea after two days. And yes, one thing that it did for me, though, and I'm just throwing this out there as a goal. You can have whatever goals you want to have, but it did give me the big picture because when, when I got to the New Testament, I'm like, well, I just read the Old Testament, like, a few weeks, you know, in, in a matter of a few weeks back there. And so when you're going to the New Testament, you're like, oh, man, all these things are popping out to you, okay? Now, that's just an example of, you know, like Brother Stuckey, I think that's a great idea, you know, with doing the New Testament in a month. If you want to go even more extreme, do the whole Bible in a month, or maybe in two months, or maybe in three months, right? And so, uh, but the thing is, is that, one thing that I think will really help your Bible reading is if you get audio Bible involved, okay? And I'm talking to the men a lot here, too, because you're driving the work, okay? You want to say, well, how do you listen to it all the time? That's all I listen to when I'm in my truck, Amen. is the Bible, okay? Barring I listen to some Christmas music <laughs> you know, during Christmas season, okay? Um, but besides that, you know, it's basically I get in my truck, score becomes on. And you say, well, you're not going to pick up everything, you know. You're going to be thinking about other stuff. And you're not going to be, that's better. Listen, you're going to pick up something. And, and who here has read through a chapter and then thought, I don't remember what I just read. <laughs> so it happens to you when you're reading. It's going to happen to you when you're listening. So ultimately, let me ask you a question. If you got through the Bible four times a year in audio and you picked up a quarter of it each time, guess what? You're going to get it all eventually. But I think you're going to get a little more than that, and you can just train yourself to do that. Now, um, and, and you say, well, you know, I need to listen to my talk radio. Stop the talk radio. Stop, you know, you know, the music that's out there today is such garbage. I mean, listen, the music that's out there today that's, that's on the, the mainstream channels or whatever, you know, I'm pumping gas. I'm in, the, I'm in the stores. I hear this garbage. Listen. I don't know, maybe you're just like, you're old, you don't know what music is today, you know? Well, maybe, but I, you know what, it all sounds the same to me, and it's all a bunch of immoral garbage anyway, okay? So what's on the radio? It's not going to be good, okay? So why don't you just put on some Scorby, or put on some audio Bible of the person you like to hear, okay? But in the end, that will do dividends for you. If you want a secret of mine, audio Bible, okay? An audio Bible, here's the thing with audio Bible, It'll help you with your reading. Because you know how I can pr pronounce a lot of these names? Audio Bible. Okay? When you're going through there and you're like, Mayor Shalal Hajbaz, or Evil Meridak, or Meridak Baladan, and you're like, how do you know how to pronounce that name? Why can you go through that? Because Scorby's read it to me at nauseum. <laughs> okay? And, you know, that's why I can read those names. Do you think I figured that out? Do you think, and listen, you can, you can figure it out. But let's just be honest, when you're reading through here, sometimes it looks like alien language when you see all those little ticks and all that stuff that you're trying to figure out how to pronounce it. But all that to say is that audio Bible will really help your pronunciation. Now, he's a little British, okay, so you might want to say herb instead of herb, okay, <laughs> and like different things like that. But it's okay. If you want to sound British, that's fine. But, uh, but all that to say is that that will really help out your reading. Now, go to, the, to Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 18 there. I want to show you another place where the Bible is telling us that we need to read. This is what I think a lot of Christians are lacking. And even in our movement, you know, the new IFB movement, if you will, is that a lot of people listen to sermons, but they don't actually read their Bible. 
you know, they're spoon-fed doctrine, but they didn't actually study it for themselves. They didn't actually see it for themselves. They're not rooted and grounded in the word themselves. They're rooted and grounded in a preacher. Okay? And so, <clears throat> it's good to listen to sermons. Okay? I'm glad that you got some good doctrine from some men of God that have, have studied it out. But you know what you need to do? Is you need to read it for yourself. You need to see it for yourself. Okay? Because if you don't see it for yourself in the Bible, then you're not going to be rooted and grounded. Because let's say that person falls away. Let's say that person fails. Well, now your rock is some man that you got your doctrine from instead of the Bible, which is the word of God that never fails. So there's a, there's a lot to be said about reading and knowing the Bible. Now, in Deuteronomy 17, verse 18, it says, And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. So, notice what's happening here. This is talking about the kings. Like, in Deuteronomy, it's basically saying, if you have a king, which you're going to do, because God knows the future, obviously. If you have a king, the king needs to copy a book, the law. Okay, so what's the book of the law? Mos- you know, the books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? You need to copy that out. And you say, why does he need to copy it? Well, they didn't have a printing press back then, okay? But also, copying something out yourself will really help you know it more. Anybody that's ever done anything like that, you know, or if you're memorizing a chapter, guess what? If you write it out, it's going to help you memorize it. And you know what? I started doing this, and I fell off the wagon, but I started copying down, you know, Genesis. And I had this little book, and I was writing it out. And I got, like, to chapter 10 or something like that, and then I got married, and then I had kids. And, you know, so a lot of these things, you know, if you're single, you know, you can really hit this stuff hard because you have a lot more time, okay? And so, and you can kind of add things that other people can't do as much. But all that say is that, is it a bad idea to copy down the Bible yourself? You're like, well, you know, we have it in so many copies, you can get it everywhere. But you know what? If you copy it down, then you're going to know it a little more, okay? And, but well, notice what it says in verse 19. It says, and it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the the, the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the, to the end, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. And you say, well, this is talking about a king, you know, this isn't talking about us. Um, did you forget the verse where it says that he's made us kings and priests and that we're a part of the royal priesthood of the believer? So guess what? Yes, this does apply to you. And <clears throat> the thing is, is that it says that he may keep the words of this law. And, and how are you going to keep the word if you don't know the word? And that's what's really missing in society is ignorant. You know, the ignorance of, of the world. And they're like, well, you know, I can't believe you said that. You know, aren't you supposed to be a Christian? You know, when it comes to like loving this person, hating this person or doing this and doing that. And they'll say, well, you know, that's not what, the, you know, that's not what, what Jesus taught. Yeah, it is. You just don't know that's what he taught. You say, well, that's not what the Bible teaches. Yes, it is. You just don't know that's what the Bible teaches on that. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, I, I think of church discipline, for example. Like, there, there's, a, there's a lack of church discipline when it comes to, like, if someone's in fornication, if someone's in, uh, you know, drunkenness. And I've been in Baptist churches where they just bring in all those people. And they're like, well, you need to reform them and all that. The Bible says they need to be thrown out of the church so that they will recover. They have to have some consequence for their actions. Okay? You say, well, that's not very loving. That doesn't seem right. Well, that's what the Bible teaches. And you may not know that because you haven't read it. Okay? And that's just one example of many. Okay? But all that to say is that, notice it says he shall read it therein once and then just leave it off. Is that what it says? So should you just read the Bible once and then be like, I read it. Or should you read it all the days of your life? Now, unless you're going to say that it's going to take him all the days of his life to read through the book of Moses, the books of Moses. <clears throat> now, listen, I thought my reading comprehension skills were bad, but if it takes him all the days of his life, then, you know, he's worse than me. But no, it's basically saying you're supposed to be reading it over and over again. OK, this isn't something where you just get through it once. and You're like, oh, did that. Check that off the list. No, you should be reading it scores of times. You know, the first step is to get it through it once. And that's the hardest thing to do. Okay? Getting through the Bible once is the hardest thing to do. Once you go through it once, it gets easier. I promise you. Okay? It took me years to get through the Bible once. 
You say, really? Yes. It took me years. Now, did it take me years to get through the New Testament? No. New Testament's a lot easier to read. But getting through the Old Testament and getting through all that stuff, as far as First Chronicles and all that, and you know, going through it all and making sure I got every single book that I've ever read, did I read other books more than once? Of course, in that time. But at the same time, when did I finally say I've read every book of the Bible? I've read every chapter of the Bible. It took me, I want to say, I got saved at 17. I started reading the Bible when I was 18 in college. And I want to say that... It took me about four years to finally get through the Bible. So, I, you know, if this gives you any hope, <laughs> okay, meaning that <clears throat> I started reading the Bible, but it took me four years to where I could actually say I've read through the Bible cover to cover. I've read every book. I've read every chapter, okay? After that, did it speed up? Yes, it did, okay? You know what really sped it up is when I met Pastor Anderson, and he's quoting off whole books. He quoted off the book of Hebrews. You know, I thought just memorizing Ephesians 2, 8, 9 was cool, <laughs> you know? And then when he's like quoting off a whole book, I'm like, oh man, you know, when you feel like you're that big fish in a little pond, you know, what you really need to get out of this sermon is that you're a little fish. And, you know, don't ever get this idea that I'm a big fish in a big pond, you know, because the worst thing you can do is compare yourselves among yourselves and say, well, you know, I'm more than that person down the street. Well, it doesn't take much. (laughs) Okay. You know, it's like saying, well, I work harder than the person that Chipotle that's dragging their feet. It doesn't take much. Okay, And so you shouldn't be comparing yourself among yourselves. What you should be always thinking is that I'm a little fish and I need to get more. And you could be a way above a lot of people. Okay, But you know what that's going to mean is that you're going to get a lot higher that way. You're going to press toward that higher ground. You know, you're going to press toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But as, as much as you say, well, I'm content, I've arrived, and all that, and you may not say this outwardly, but we should never get that mentality that, hey, I've arrived. And listen, I'm preaching to myself because, you know, I've read through the Bible many times and I have a lot of Bible memorized. But do you think I'm standing up here saying, yeah, I've done enough? I never feel like I've done enough. I always feel like I'm behind. I always feel like I need to read more. I feel like four times a year is still not enough for me to know what I need to know when I'm standing up here. Okay, so that being said, we need to always be increasing and we need to be reading it all the days of our life. Think of verses, uh, you know, in Luke 4, 4. Now, we usually think of man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Well, in Luke 4, 4, it's the same thing, but it just says by every word of God. Okay? And so, two places in the Bible, and I know they're parallel passages, but you know what? When God puts a parallel passage in there, you know what it means? You know what it's, it's, it's signifying is that this is important. Okay? So, if you ever see a passage in all four Gospels, guess what? That's probably very important that it's mentioned in all four Gospels, okay? Like the crucifixion, you know, like stuff like that. But there's other things that are, you know, certain things that are mentioned in all four Gospels, or they're mentioned more than once. Some things are mentioned once. Now, does that mean it's not important? No, obviously it's important. But if things are mentioned over and over and over and over again, you're like, man, I see that here, I see that here, I see this here. Guess what? It's very important. And so, you know, this is obviously when Jesus is being tempted, but in Luke 4, 4, it says, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And he's quoting Deuteronomy, by the way. So in Deuteronomy, this is, this is quoted. So this isn't something that's just New Testament here. This is obviously something that should be, you know, from before the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, you know, all the time. Now, Job, go to Job 23. Job 23 <clears throat> and don't worry, I know this is the first point, but honestly, when it comes to this, when it comes to Bible reading, this is the thing that I look at as being like the number one thing I think about at the beginning of the year. Bible reading, okay? Job 23 and verse 12, it says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So one thing you need to be thinking about in this new year is the fact of, okay, you know, how important is it for me to read the Bible? Is it more important than the food I eat? Okay. And this is something that I want to implement myself, meaning that um, sometimes, you know, and I'm always listening to the Bible on the way to work, but I want to read before I even get out the door. Okay. So this is something I'm personally going to try to increase, meaning that I want to read and pray before I leave the door, before I leave my house. Okay. And you say, well, you know, this all comes down to schedule, right? Because when it comes down to it, when you're, when you're leaving someone, you're like, you're like 
given the most time that you can sleep. If you're like me, you're like, okay, how much time was it really going to take me to get there that I can get there by the skin of my teeth so that I can sleep one extra minute, okay? But this is where you got to say, okay, I'm going to get up a little earlier knowing that I could get to work or I could get to the gym, you know, without getting up this early, knowing that I'm going to read a chapter or two just to get the day started and to do that. And, you know, before you eat, okay, so, and I don't eat breakfast necessarily. I've already kind of discussed that. I just have a protein shake after I get done with my workout. But, but all I have to say is that, you know, how about you read a chapter before you even eat anything, okay? Now, if you have medical reasons why you need to eat as soon as you wake up, then eat, okay? This is obviously, you know, uh, just something I'm implementing and all that. But, but I think Job implemented that as well, meaning that, he saw God's word as being more important than his necessary food. And, you know, other verses on this, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Okay? So as a pastor, guess what I'm telling you? Give attendance to reading. <laughs> okay? So if Timothy is supposed to be giving attendance to reading in the church that he's pastoring, guess what I'm going to say? Give attendance to reading. And, you know, when you think of the verse, there's many verses on this when it comes to the Word of God, but uh, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. So if you want to grow this year, if you want to increase this year, you're not going to do it unless you're reading the Bible, okay? So the number one thing you should be doing to increase is to read more of the Bible, to listen more of the Bible. Get yourself a schedule. Get into a routine. That's the key, okay? When I get into my truck, I don't think, Am I going to listen to Scorby? No, it just comes on, okay? Now, your car may not do that. Maybe it has to, like, you have to hit a button, okay? But you know what you need to get into is a, is, is a, a thing where it's like, boom, button. You know, boom, it's on. And, and you know, it, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't be thinking, well, I want to listen to this. I want to listen to that. Now, listen, if you're on a long trip, I'm not saying you need to listen to the Bible the whole time you're in the vehicle. I mean, you could turn it off. You know, because there's times where I've traveled, I'm like listening, I've listened to two books of the Bible, and I'm like, all right, gone through Joshua and Judges, I need, a, I need a little time to think about this, okay? But all I have to say is that, you know, if you're driving 30 minutes to work, even 10 minutes to work, whatever it is, or an hour, I mean, good night, if you're doing an hour, and you listen through the audio Bible, you'll get through it four times in a year, if you're doing that consistently. And so, I can't stress that enough, Okay? And, you know, people will downgrade it and say, well, it's not as good as reading. I disagree. There are certain things that I've heard listening to the Bible that I didn't see when I was reading it. But there are certain things that I saw reading it that I didn't pick up when I was listening to it. I think both are important. I think you're blessed in both that you do. I think both are, are, should be there. But I'll say this. I think audio is going to help everybody out. Okay? Because now you're not worried about the reading part of it. You're just listening to it. And you can, just, you can concentrate on what's being said you're not having to put all the inflections in there. You're not having to figure out when do I need to pause in the way I'm saying. You don't need to figure out how it's said. Now, is Scorby perfect in every way he inflects things? No, okay? So don't take that to the bank. Is every inflection that he does or every way he reads it is right. But mostly, yes, he's right because it's, it's, it's not that complicated of English to, to read. Now, uh, after reading, I would go into memoriz- or I'm sorry, go into good doctrine, okay? Now, memorization is going to come, but... Good doctrine. Now, you're not going to get good doctrine if you're not reading. Now, can you get good doctrine from preaching? Yeah, but you're only going to get that if you're going to be hearing a lot of Bible when you're getting that doctrine. But ultimately, this should be coming from you getting it yourself. You need to feed yourselves, okay? Meaning that I will spoon feed you. You know, that's why you come to church. I'm, I'm like, here's, here's your medicine for the day. Here's your, your meal for the day. And, you know, but in the end... I can't, you know, and I'm going through chapter by chapter through the Bible, okay? Meaning we're on Wednesday nights, we're going expository preaching where I'm doing chapter by chapter. But listen, it's going to be a while before we get through the whole Bible, and not everybody's here every single time I'm going through those chapters, and you may not even be at this church when I'm done with it, you know? You never know what can happen or where you may move or something, you know, whatever. So that being said, I can't, I can't say, well, I'm going to give you the whole Bible this year. That's not practical, Okay? And Proverbs chapter 1, go to Proverbs chapter 1, because what you need to be thinking about is obviously your Bible reading needs to increase. 
or at least be at a good level, meaning that if you're at a very good level, if you're, if, listen, if you're sitting in here today and you're reading through the Bible four times a year, that's a good level. Stay at that. Maintain it. Okay? But if you're here and you say, well, I, ha- I didn't read through it once last year. I got through some of it, but I didn't read through it once. Well, you need to increase that to at least once. And listen, if, you're at, if you say, well, I get through it once a year, why don't you increase it to one and a half? Why don't you increase it to two? Okay? And so that's what you need to be thinking about. And so obviously there's a cap-off point where it's kind of a, a point of diminishing return, meaning that you're getting to the point where you're reading it so much that you can't even think about it, or you don't have enough time to read it that much. Okay? So there are things that need to be done. You need to take care of your family. You need to work. You need to do all these other things. And so obviously there's going to be a point where you can't read more than that. Okay? But uh, you need to look into what you're doing and say, okay, could I read more? And I think most of, it could, of us could say yes to that. I think most all of us could say yes to a certain extent. Now, uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5, it says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. <coughs> and, you know, when I think about doctrine, a lot of times I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about hard passages, right? Because most of us, you know, when you're looking at this, you're like, well, salvation is by grace through faith. It's not by works. It's eternal security. Listen, you don't really need to pound that in too hard, you know, when, with your Bible reading. But I'll say this, even with those type of doctrines that are just really easy doctrines or things that are very super clear, you could always find more verses that bolster that same doctrine. You could always find the passages that people to attack that doctrine with and understand those passages that would answer those questions. There's always things that you could be doing with a simple doctrine or a very main, uh, main doctrine, foundational doctrine that you can sure up. Think of the Trinity. You know, think of even baptism or just other things that you could say, okay, well, you know, I don't understand this one. And what you should do is say, okay, I'm going to pick a doctrine. I'm going to ask myself, you know, just ask yourself, test yourself. Do you know some verses off the top of your head that will prove that doctrine? If you do, find some more. If you don't, find some and, you know, get some good doctrine. And obviously reading through the Bible, you're going to see some of this stuff, okay? Ephesians chapter 4 deals with this. Now, this is where the, the, the church comes into effect as far as how you're going to grow. And I believe a lot of churches aren't growing spiritually or in doctrine or in learning because it's just not being taught. Let's just be honest. I mean, the same stuff's being taught over and over and over again. And there's nothing wrong with the same doctrines being preached. But listen, if I preach to you on eternal security, for example, I'm not just going to re-preach that same sermon. Okay? There might be some things in there that are the same and some big points that are the same, but I'm usually going to probably try to find something else or another angle to come into it at. Does that make sense? Because, first of all, I don't want to be bored preaching. Okay? I don't like preaching the same sermons. And, you know, there's times where I preach the same doctrine, and I, I'm like, man, I feel like I'm re-preaching this. Even though I'm even preaching out of a different passage on the same subject, it just, to me, I, I get to that point where I'm like, I don't want to preach the same thing over again. But some things do need to be preached over again. Some things need to be hit on, uh, you know, the, on the head more than once and all that. But uh, the church is a, a good place to get doctrine, okay? It's a, good place, it's, a, it's a good place to make sure you're safe on your doctrine, that you're not going out of bounds, okay? And this is where, you know, having a pastor that is uh, not a novice, someone that's grounded in, in doctrine, okay, and I'm not saying I'm the only one, but I'm saying that there's other pastors that are very grounded in doctrine. And if, you, if you're reading through the Bible, you're like, well, what about this and some wild-eyed you know, type of you know, doctrine? You know, coming to church is really going to bring that in. Be like, no, it can't be that because of this. Okay? And that's where that modalism stuff, you know, people like didn't never hear about modalism, never really studied the Trinity that hard. And then when someone comes in with some kind of, you know, wild eyed theory about it and a verse that seems to disprove the Trinity a little bit, everybody's just like, well, maybe that is right. And everybody's falling into that trap. But if you have if you have people that have seen that doctrine before and know what they're trying to do and knowing how they're twisting it, then when you come to church, you can say, okay, yeah, you know, that makes sense. And so this is where the church is very important, okay? For many reasons, but this is a good one. Doctrine. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, it says, And he gave some apostles and, and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. 
So there's, there are different reasons, obviously, for the church. Obviously, the work, soul winning, all that. But how about the edifying of the body of Christ? So obviously, reading your Bible and doing your daily reading, doing your personal reading is how you're going to edify yourself. Because obviously, in the end, you know, you can know everything in this Bible that I know. But the church is there to be basically uh, this pillar and ground of the truth, if you will. This kind of stability in your Bible reading and your doctrine. Okay? And notice in verse uh, 13, it says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie, lay, lie in wait to deceive. And I think about modalism, honestly, when I think about this passage on the recent events, as far as people being carried away with the, the crafty, cunning craftiness of men and, you know, getting, being carried away, away with these, you know, doctrines that are not right. This says in verse 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So we're talking about growing, growing up into him. Verse, verse 16, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Okay, so if you want to increase, obviously your own personal Bible reading is crucial. But guess what? Coming to church and hearing preaching is also a crucial part of that increasing in learning. Okay? And so that is something that needs to be there. Okay? Because if you're not in church, you're missing a part of that. You're missing this part where you're going to increase and it's going to be... And it's, it's talking about the whole church coming together and all the unity, all the fellowship... Who here has, <clears throat> you don't necessarily have to raise your hand, but again, if you want, who here has learned something from somebody else in the church besides me? You know, like just talking about different doctrines, talking about different verses, or someone gave you a verse. I'll raise my hand. Someone showed me verses that I, that I I'm like, oh, that's cool, you know, or that makes sense. Did it, did it veer off from major doctrines that we believe? Did it veer off from our statement of faith? No. But there's certain verses where it's like, oh, yeah, that's great. You know, that proves this point even more. And so, you know, that's where you come in there that not even just the pastor, but even the people in the church can edify each other and working together in that unity there. Uh, but a famous verse on this, you know, as far as learning doctrine, in uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, <clears throat> what do you need to do? You need to read the Bible. But you also need to study it, Okay. Now, studying in your own time, of course, but also studying it when you're coming to... And isn't that what we're dealing with here? Because what are Wednesday nights? Usually, it's a Bible study. It's a study, okay? A lot of... You know, and I try to do this to where I'm doing uh, kind of a, a doctrinal sermon here and more of a, uh, an exhortation here or even a rebuke over here with sermons. So I'm not, like, just coming at you with every single sermon, just deep doctrine, Okay? Now, if you want my opinion, I like those sermons. <laughs> okay, those are, the, those are the fun ones for me. I like deep doctrine. I'm more of an analytical, like I like figuring out puzzles and stuff like that. But you also need the exhortation. This is more of an exhortation sermon. This isn't deep doctrine here, <laughs> okay? This is exhortation for you to go out and increase more and more. And in other sermons, I'll be preaching against fornication. That's a rebuke, a reproof. It can also be an exhortation that if you're pure, then keep going, right? But uh, I think there needs to be balance there. But all that to be saying is that not every sermon you're getting is a Bible study necessarily. So you need to be doing your Bible study as well, okay? Now, uh, go to uh, Psalm 119, verse 11. So we saw Bible reading. We need to increase that. We need to be reading the Bible all the days of our life. There's not a time where you're saying, I've read enough. Because guess what? You'll forget. You will forget what you've read. And so there's many times that I'm going through the Bible and I'm like, man, I know I used to know that. But it's just like it kind of refreshes you a little bit. You're like, oh, yeah, that's right. And uh, I know Pastor Anderson, I was talking to him one time and he was saying, you know, like he preached a sermon years ago. And someone said, you know, I, I you know, brought up something to him. And he's like, that's a good truth. You know, never thought of that. And he's like, and the person's like, yeah, you preached that in 2006 or something like that. He's like, really? You know? So, you know, that happens. 
And there's been times where I've preached a sermon and, and I've re-listened to it because I'm kind of going over the same topic. I want to see what I hit on because I don't want to re-preach the same thing over again. And I'm like, man, that's a good truth there. I forgot about that, you know? And, you know, so there's things like that to where, you, because when you're going into a sermon like that, you're looking at all these things and you're kind of finding things and all that. And so you always need to refresh anyway. You need to be keep reading. Now, when it comes to memorization, notice what it says in Psalm 119, verse 11. It says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So David is saying here that he hid God's word in his heart. So if you want to know, like, my idea of memorization is hiding the word of God in your heart. Having it there to where you know it. And what's the point? Meaning this is that when there comes an occasion to sin, his word is there to say no. Okay? And I know I'm kind of bringing up fornication, but if you think of fornication, it'd be like, okay, the Bible says flee fornication. So you come up to that point where it's possible or you're getting in that situation, verses on your mind. Or drunkenness, right? Drinking. Like, let's say you're in a, a place where it's like you're in a company event or you're doing something and they're just like, ah, oh, you know, here's a beer or whatever. Uh, look not on the wine when it is red, when it, it moveth itself with the right, when it give, giveth its cover in the cup. Wine is a marker, strong drink is raging, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. That's the type of stuff that you need to be thinking about. You say, really, do you need, because you can know that it's wrong, but if you have the verse literally verbatim in your mind, then it's going to be very, it's going to be a lot, it's going to be a lot better for you as far as the deterrent, Okay. And that's why, you know, one big reason to memorize the Bible is for knowing God's laws, knowing what he wants you to do in certain situations. Think of all the Proverbs, right? A soft answer turneth away wrath. You know, when you think about someone like being really angry with you, being, you know, like, and they're just being very confrontational with you in a meeting. I'm talking about just everyday life, right? Everyday life, you're in a, you're in a situation and someone's being really angry and confrontational with you and you say, a soft answer turneth away wrath. And you're like, and, and instead of, meeting them there with that same intensity, you pull it back and say, I see where you're coming from. You know, let's see if we can figure this out. That's going to de-escalate the situation. Now, your flesh is going to say, I want to rip this person's face off because I'm right, he's wrong, right? And so, but do you see how a verse like that, because now you know, okay, that's what I should do. Now it's your choice whether you're going to do it or not. I'm not saying because you know the verse that you're going to actually do it, but if you don't know the verse... Then how are you going to know to do it? Okay. Now, uh, go to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. So here's Psalm 119. Go back to Psalm 1. just want to show you some verses on this. Because another way that it says it is to meditate on his word. And obviously you can meditate on something that you've read. But how much more can you meditate on something that you know word for word in your mind? Okay. So, uh, you know, when it comes to meditating on the word of God, I look at memorization as being like just a, a... the best way to meditate on the Word of God, if you will. Okay, Because does it say, thou shalt memorize the Word of God, thou shalt memorize books of the Bible? Listen, how about this? And think about this for a second. When Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he talked about, uh, he, he asked them a question. He basically said, if this servant does his duty, you know, and he does everything that, the pers- that his, his master told him to do, is he profitable? And I'm paraphrasing here, but he said no. Say, I've done my duty, I'm unprofitable. Because what is profitability? Something above and beyond that mark. For example, if you're working at a job, unless you, you, you do a job and you get paid just enough to where you break even, okay? You paid your expenses, you paid the salaries, you paid the overhead, but you have nothing left over. That's unprofitable. Did you pay your salary? Do you, do you have money to put food on the table, all that stuff? Yeah, that's not profitable. Profitable is when you make money above and beyond that. You have money that's out, that's out there that didn't need to pay salaries, didn't need to pay overhead. So profitability is not saying that you're not doing what you should be doing. Profitability is saying that you're doing above and beyond. So you know what? You know what I like? You, you, you say, do you like the fact that the Bible doesn't say memorize books? Yeah, because guess what? I'm doing more than what God said for me to do. Right? The Bible says meditate on the Word of God. It says to hide the Word in your heart. Okay? Did it say memorize the whole Bible? Did it say memorize the book of the Bible? Did it say anything like that? So when I look at these things, what you need to be looking about is saying, hey, I want to do more than what God tells me to do. Could you, could you be a good Christian and just read the Bible and not memorize a whole bunch of like, books of the Bible? Yeah. There's people that are doing great things for God that don't have that much memorized. But do you want to just do your duty? 
or do you want to be profitable? Okay? And that's where this kind of comes in as far as increasing more and more, being above and beyond that. Okay? And so, all that to say is that, you know, there's things to think about with that. Uh, Psalm 1, verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of God, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Amen. So he's, he's meditating in it. And there's other places that talk about this, and I'm going to show you some other ones. But, um, but verse 3 there, why is that important? Because it's going to make you profitable. It's going to make you successful. It's going to make you prosperous. Okay? Notice what it says in verse 3. It says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Okay, so when it, when it comes to this, you can always look at this in the real world explanation. If you're profiting your company, guess what? You're going to prosper yourself. Because no one's going to want to lose someone that's getting them a bunch of profits. Okay, and so when, you, when you're looking at this, you need to think about this as far as we're God's servants. We're working for God. And when you're being profitable, when you're increasing more and more, guess what? God's going to hear you more and more. God's going to be promoting you more and more. And... You know, there's a lot of things to look at this, but in the end, <clears throat> I want to do more because I want to please God. I want to do more because God deserves it. Does, does Jesus not deserve profitability from his servants? I say he deserves as much profit as he can get. Okay, as much profit as I can get him. Okay, at least duty. Okay, so obviously that's the mark that everybody should be at is duty. Duty out soul winning. Duty in your Bible reading. Duty in the commandments that you keep, right? But how about above that? How about things that he didn't ask you to do, but you know they're good, and you do it anyway? And so those are the types of things you need to be thinking about when increasing. Uh, Joshua chapter 1 is a good place to look at, dealing with meditating on the Word of God. Again, notice it's day and night. There's places where uh, it talks about, David talks about the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's pretty much the idea of burning the midnight oil, right? You know, the lamps are going out. He's still reading the Bible, all that stuff. Um, and so, you know, you can think about that with your Bible reading. Has there ever been a time where you're just like, you didn't want to give it up? You know, you should probably go to bed, but you're still reading and all that. Um, have you ever fallen asleep while you're reading the Bible? And I'm not counting church. Listen, church service does not count as far as falling asleep. So if you fall asleep in church, that's on you. <laughs> no. But all I'd say is that, have you ever been like, you know, you're just trying to get it and you're just d- dead tired to where you're just out? You know, and, uh, you know, you need, David's obviously a good place to look to, and Psalm 119 is a great place to look to with this. But in Joshua 1 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Okay? So if you want to be profitable, if you want to have success, and you need to increase this. Okay? You need to increase this meditation on his word, and obviously memorization is going to help you with that, okay? So I look at memorization as being uh, basically the hand and glove with meditation, okay? Because think about it. Well, let's say you're out doing something that's monotonous, right? You're mowing the grass. You know, you're doing something out, you know, like on a a farm. Let's say you're doing work with, uh, you know, like where you're just not, you're not working with people, you're not talking to people, but you're just kind of doing something. It's going to take you a long time, very monotonous. You don't have to think a lot about it. You know, yeah. Do you have a book memorized? Do you have a chapter memorized? Go through that chapter and think about it. You know, quote it off, but then think about the verses. Think about how it's said. And you're not gonna be able to do that by having, you know, you're like driving a tractor and then you're like over here looking at this thing, like trying to figure it out. You know, <laughs> like that's not gonna probably end well. You know, but you know, things to think about with with memorization. Uh, but even in, uh, you don't have to turn there, but First John chapter two, verse fourteen, it says. I've written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. And so there's other places where we're talking about the word of God abiding in you. And the thing that, why that's important, go to John chapter 14, the last thing I'll show you on the memorization portion, is that the Holy Ghost can bring these things to remembrance, okay? But if you don't have it memorized, or if, at least if you haven't read it a lot, because there's passages that I didn't, personally like sit down and say I'm going to memorize this but I but I could bring it to remembrance because I've read it that many times or I've heard it that many times or I've studied it that many times it just 
happens. You know, you think about the, the, your soul winning plan. A lot of you probably didn't even have to memorize it because you said it so many times that you just memorized it, right? Because you said it so many times. That's the way I memorized a lot of the soul winning plan is that I just said it so many times. I read it so many times. You know, it's like, yeah, I can just quote that off. But uh, in John 14, verse 26, it's talking about the Comforter, the Holy Ghost. Notice what it says. John 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So Jesus is talking here, saying he's going to bring things to remembrance that I said unto you. Well, what did he say? Well, this is the word of God, right? And Jesus is the word. So he's going to bring it to remembrance, but he can't bring something to remembrance if you didn't hear it. Notice that I said unto you, if you didn't hear Jesus say it unto you, then how is he going to bring it to remembrance? And so this is what you need to be thinking about as far as uh, the more you read, the more you memorize, the more you meditate on the word of God, the more the Holy Ghost can draw from that. Now, let's say you just had John 3, 16 memorized. Well, that's better than nothing. But do you think that the Holy Ghost wants to pull out more than John 3, 16? I'm sure that he, he, he's, he's, give me something else, you know, <laughs> because there's other things in the Bible besides salvation that you need to be thinking about. And so, and this comes into when you're reading or when you're studying, the more you have memorized, the easier that study is going to be because you're going to have more Bible in your memory that, that the Holy Ghost can pull out and say, hey, this goes to that. Amen. When you're, when you memorize the New Testament, because the New Testament is probably the easier, th- the easier passages to memorize, when you're going and reading through these cryptic passages, now you have this munition of the New Testament in your mind, in the back of your mind, to basically go through that cryptic passage and say, well, this can't be what this is saying here because these verses over here. Okay? And it's all right in the back of your mind. Okay? And the Bible is big, by the way. So this is why this is important because you're not going to just be able to, like, read through the New Testament real quick and see, all right, does that con- conflict with anything, <laughs> right? I mean, I guess if you're doing it in a month, then, but you still have to wait a month to get to the point where you're like, all right, I read through the New Testament again. All right, so does that conflict with anything? But how about you have a bunch of books memorized or you have a bunch of chapters memorized or at least you have a, a good bit, okay? The more you have, the better. But, you know, you need to be thinking about that and the Holy Ghost can pull that out. Anybody that's been out soul winning knows that there's been things that... that have been brought to your remembrance. Now, is the Holy Ghost saying, you know, Miss Paula, remember Luke 17? You know, like, no. But what you're doing is like, when you're going through this, and you're like, oh yeah, I remember that passage that mentioned the same thing that was correlating to this. And if you don't have it off the top of your tongue that you can say it, you can at least know where it's at. Okay? Those are the types of things that you need to be thinking about when it comes to memorization. How about increasing your faith? Uh, go to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. So what we see so far, increase your Bible reading, increase your doctrine, your learning. Okay, which doctrine is just that, right? Learning. It's just a teaching. Increase the amount of teachings or doctrines that are in the Bible that you know. Increase your memorization. Increase your faith. Now, in Luke chapter 17, verse 5, his apostles asked Jesus this, this to, to increase their faith. He's or, you know, basically uh, asking him to do it. And then in verse 5 there it says, And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in, in the sea, and it should obey you. So, it doesn't really say... Like, when you're reading this passage, you're like, okay, he said increase our faith, and then he said, if you have faith, as a great message, he's not really, it's not really answering it exactly. But if you look at that, and this is kind of a, a Bible study, uh, I don't want to say trick, but a technique, okay? When you look at, like, let's say a sentence like that, is there anything in that sentence that's mentioned anywhere else? And the idea of a faith of the grain of mustard seed is mentioned somewhere else. Go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. This is where reading and memorization can help you with your Bible study. Because you may look at this and say, well, it didn't really tell me how I can increase my faith. But there's some clues in the passage that's being said that you can look at another place and pick up some more information. Now, this is a case where his disciples could not cast out uh, the devil out of this, this person's son. 
And this is where Jesus comes in and, and actually does it. But then he's going to basically explain why, why they couldn't do it. OK, so if you couple that with the fact that they're saying increase our faith, I believe he's going to give the answer on how you do it. OK, so in, in Matthew 17, verse 19, it says, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. So what's the subject here as far as why they couldn't cast him out? Lack of faith, right? Unbelief, lack of faith, however you want to look at it. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Sound familiar? Now, I said a sycamine tree in one, it says a mountain here. The same idea of the, the faith of the grain of mustard seed. Notice in verse 21. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So, I believe this is telling us that if you want to increase your faith, here's how you can do it. Prayer and fasting. Okay? And so, increasing your faith is something we need to think about. And now, some people, you know, when it comes to fasting, you really, some people can't do fasting, okay? I don't believe fasting is, is, is necessarily mandatory, but at the same time, I do believe that a lot of us can do it, okay? And we don't have to do 40 days and 40 nights here, okay? We're talking like you could do a day. You could do two days, right? And if you have medical conditions where you have to eat certain things and all this stuff, then listen, this is not what I'm talking about, okay, because I don't want you to crash or do something that would be really bad, okay, but I'm talking about just a typical person that, that can do this without having problems, then, you know, fasting will definitely get you closer to God, <laughs> okay, because when you're hungry, you know, you need all the help you can get, okay, when I'm weak, then am I strong in the Lord, you know, and listen, when I'm not eating, I am weak, and, uh, but, but also, Prayer, you know, prayer is a big thing. Now, how about another way? I believe there is another way to increase your faith. Go to James chapter 2. Now, James chapter 2 is usually ripped out of context and say that you need to do works to be saved and to go to heaven. But actually, I believe this passage is actually showing us how to increase our faith. Or as it says in, in James chapter 2, to perfect your faith. Okay? So if you're perfecting your faith, I would say it's increasing. Okay? Um, and so... Uh, it gives this example of Abraham, okay? Notice what it says in verse 21. So James 2, verse 21, it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And notice this, by works was faith made perfect. So what made faith perfect? Works. And it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now, I've preached this many times. Obviously, he's saved by faith, and that's how he got righteousness. But then, being the friend of God is how he perfected his faith. And how do you be the friend of God? You're my friends if you do whatsoever I recommend you. Okay? So, this passage in James is talking about Christians that if you don't do the works, you have dead faith. And what is it? Unprofitable. What doth it profit, my brethren? What are we talking about today? Being profitable. Okay, increasing, and you think of increase. What's increase? Profit. Increase is profit. Okay, so if you want to increase more and more, you want to be more profitable, meaning that you can't have dead faith and be profitable, and your faith isn't going to increase if you're not doing the works. Okay, so three ways to increase your faith: prayer, fasting, works. I can't do. I can't do that three. You know, like that is the hardest thing to do. Does anyone else have a problem doing three like that? I feel like a child when I'm trying to do that. I have to do it like this. But I'm just like, over here I can do it a little bit. But over here it's just, uh, anyway. So if I mess up my finger movements over here, that's why. But anyway, all I have to say is that I believe those are three ways that you can increase your faith. And so, guess what? Going out soul winning? Who here would say that their faith has been increased seeing people saved? I would say everybody would say that, right? Anybody that sees anybody get saved, you're just like, yes, you know, you're just, you're revived. You're, you're, you're ready to go. You know, it just kind of lets everything float away. All that stuff will increase your faith. Prayer, fasting, doing the works of God, you know. And this has nothing to do with going to heaven, okay. What I'm preaching on today has all to do with what you do as a Christian to be profitable, okay. Now, uh, go, to, um, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Actually, go to Proverbs chapter 14. You know Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through, through 10. <clears throat> but for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
But it says, for we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, or created in Christ Jesus, under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so we should walk in his works because we are created as his workmanship. Okay? So if we're his workmanship, doesn't it make sense that we should increase that? Okay? And that, see, these things meld into each other. So this isn't like you separate this one, this one, this one, this one. Listen, if you're doing the works, you're going to increase your faith. And if you're doing the works to increase your faith, guess what? You're doing this one, <laughs> okay? So, but I do want to show you that, you know, this is a kind of a famous verse that we use a lot, um, you know, and this kind of goes into our, our children's rooms getting destroyed. <laughs> you know, when it comes to, like, things like this, we want to take care of our things, but at the same time, listen, we know this to be true, that if our church is clean without any messes, that means that we're not doing anything, <laughs> okay? That means that work isn't getting done, and you know what? I'd rather have a whole bunch of children. I'd rather that our church be 50% children, if not more, and be a little messy. I actually like that. I, I like the fact that we have a lot of children in our church. Amen. And you know when Because, listen, most churches have an average age of 80 to dead. Okay? And so, and that's not against, you know, older people. But what I'm saying is that our churches, you know, churches in, by, by the masses are dying off physically because they're just older people in there. And you look at our church, and it's like the average, the average age is like 10. Not quite. But what I'm saying is, like, when you add in all the children in there, it's really kind of like the average age is actually a teenager age, you know, because a lot of people are in their 30s and 40s, but then you have, like, you know, infants and all that stuff. So when you, when you bring that down, you know, our average age is pretty, pretty low. And so, um, but all it says is that I like that, but this verse right here in Proverbs 14, verse 4, it says, Where no oxen are, the crib is clean. But notice this, but much increase is made is by the strength of the ox. Okay. Now I preached a sermon last uh, week about bodily exercise profiteth. Okay. So we don't want to just get up here and be like, oh, you know, it's all about the spiritual realm. That means I can be, you know, huge, three hundred pounds, and you know, praise God, I'm, I'm, you know, on God's side and all that. No, we need to be in shape. Okay. We need to be able to do the work. Okay. But what we're talking about today is more of the spiritual realm. Okay, so we need to increase by strength. And how are you going to get strength? By reading the Word of God, by having good doctrine, by memorizing the Bible, and by, you know, by doing, increasing your faith and doing the works. You know, all these things are going to help you to be profitable. Okay? But you need to basically go into this new year knowing, hey, where in these places can I increase? You know, I don't know if anybody's writing anything down, but... Here, you know, kind of the, the, the ideas of reading, doctrine, memorization, uh, increasing your faith, increasing your labor. How can I improve that for this year? Okay? And, you know, that's the type of stuff that we need to be thinking about because we want to be fruitful. Go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, is talking about Jesus being the vine, and we are the branches, so, in this passage, we're not dealing with unsaved or saved people. We're dealing with all saved people here, okay? And the idea, though, is that, yeah, we want to be fruitful, but we also want to be increasing that. You know, we want that to increase. And listen, as our church grows, guess what? That's going to increase. You know, because more people are going to go out soul winning. More people are going to grow. The church is going to grow, and the fruit's going to keep going on and on and on and on. You know, you, if, you, if you win someone to Christ, and then you teach them to do the same thing, guess what? It's multiplying, and, and that fruit's going to grow and grow and grow. Now, in, in John chapter uh, 15 is that story, um, but you think of the, the parable of the sower, you know, the, the, the seed that landed in the good ground, and said it, it, bring, it bears fruit and bringeth forth some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. You know, those are quantities, and, you know, like I said, if you're already at 30 a year, you could say, well, I want to be 60. Or if you're at 60, you'd be like, I want to be at 100. Or if you say, well, I'm not at 30 souls saved a year, I want to attain to that. Or you could just say, listen, I want to get one person saved this year. That's a great goal. If you never want anybody to Christ and you say, you know what, I want to win one person to the Lord this year, that's a great goal. You win one person to the Lord, you're already above most Christians in the world. Unfortunately. <laughs> okay. But after that, you say, well, you know what, I want to win two people. And then three people, and then four people, and say, you know what, I want to win ten people. And you know what, that's going to increase faster than you think, okay? Listen, if you're starting to win like ten people to Christ in a year, you, you have to be in some kind of routine, and that's going to actually increase a lot faster than you think, 
Okay, so you need to set these goals to be fruitful. And uh, John 15 and verse 1, it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And that's what we're talking about today. I'm talking about a fruitful church here. Mountain Baptist Church, I believe, we're bringing forth fruit. We're seeing close to 200 people saved a year. And people baptized, people growing in the Lord. And I can go into that in more detail if you wanted me to. But in the, in the end, I believe that we're growing and that we're fruitful. But what we want to do is be more fruitful. You know, we want to purge some things. We want to basically get, you know, make some of the rough edges smooth and just kind of get more honed in. Every year, I think we should try to hone in more and more and more. Okay? We should never get content. Okay? And notice what it says as you keep going there. It says, now ye, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. Side note, unsaved people can't get people saved. I don't know how you get around this, but if you're not in the vine, you're not getting anybody saved. Okay? Verse 5, it says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, uh, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So, how do, you, how, do you bear, how do you get to increase like that? Well, you just need to keep abiding in Christ. If you keep doing this stuff, listen, it's going to get easier. Like I said, you read through the Bible one time, next time it's going to be a lot easier. You read through it twice, it's going to be even easier after that. The more you read it, the easier it becomes because it becomes second nature, and you're like, I've read this before, and Holly knows this, you'll know when I read through a passage that I have memorized. Because I'm like going through that thing like it's nothing. It, to the point where I have to slow down. I'm like, no, I need, to, I need to read that a little slower. Because you have it memorized. It's just like you know it. You don't even need to look at the page. Okay? So it's going to get easier as you go on. And we want to bear f- much fruit. And that's, that's the thing that I see in this passage is that you're bearing fruit. Okay, let's purge some things. And this is where Jesus comes in. He's going to purge some things. He's going to try to step on your toes, get some things out of your life, move things around to where you're more focused on him, purge to where, and what you want to be, and the goal is, which I don't think we'll ever really get to, is, is pure efficiency. Okay? You're just doing everything you have to do in this life to, to survive, keep your children, you know, and have some sanity, and doing everything you can for the Lord. Okay? Now, let me know when you arrived at that point. <laughs> okay? Where you feel like, I'm doing everything that I can for the Lord, I've got everything else in a set order that I needed to be set in. I don't think anybody's ever going to be in that place where you're just like, yeah, I'm just running at 100%. Okay? So we all need to be purging some things. We all need to be cleaning up things. We all need to be doing stuff like that. And uh, I had another passage. You don't have to turn there. But um, in 2 Peter, I'm going to close it because we're out of time. But 2 Peter talks about this. It talks about growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It talks about adding to your faith virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. So the idea of increasing or adding to is something that is a, is a principle that's throughout the whole Bible here. Okay, And the idea is to have increase. And this is the passage where it says, so that an abundant entrance, you know, so that an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you know, if you if you you can go into the, the kingdom just by being saved, obviously, just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, but wouldn't you rather have that abundant entrance? And this is what Jesus, I'll end it with this. Jesus is saying, you know, when he's talking about he's the, the good shepherd and everybody else is the thief and a robber. It says in, in John ten ten, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The way to have that more abundant life, now that's not saying like it's, you're more saved than someone else. It just means that you're going to have an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom instead of just an entrance into the everlasting kingdom. You're going to have rewards, you're going to have crowns, you're going to have all these different things that you're going to have to show for the work that you did. And abundance is talking about profit, increase. We need to increase more and more. We need to be profitable. I don't want it to be the church that's just known, well, they're doing their duty. I want to be known as a church that's, say, that's saying, you know what, we're setting the bar higher than others. You know? And we're not looking at others. I'm not looking at another church. 
I didn't like Google all the other churches and friends that I have and say, okay, what are they doing over here? What are they doing over here? No, we're doing what we're doing here, and I'm setting the marks higher. I'm trying to do more, and this should be on a personal basis as well, okay? Because the more you do it, the easier it will be for the church to do it as a whole, okay? Because ultimately, I can set those bars high, but if you can't attain to it, or if you don't want to attain to it, it's not going to help, okay? But if everybody's just on board and everybody's increasing, guess what? It's going to be easier, okay? It's going to be a matter of just, okay, who's going to do what, <laughs> okay? And when are we going to do it? So something to think about for this new year, increasing more and bo- more, abounding more and more. Um, you know, keep doing what you're doing, but just try to see if there's places where you can increase that. So let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Pray that you be with us uh, throughout the rest of today and the fellowship that we have. I uh, pray, pray that you bless the food that we're about to eat. And then, Lord, also with the soul winning that, that afterwards, I pray that you uh, keep us warm as it's getting a little colder out. And then uh, also just keep us safe um, as we go out, deliver from any unreasonable or wicked men. Uh, we pr- just pray that you would have free course. But ultimately, Lord, this year, we pray that you would help us to increase more and more, to help us to do more to glorify you and to be glorified at and everything that we do at this church, Lord, just pray that you'd help us with that. And Lord, we love you and pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.